from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. On behalf of the audience, thank you. And my first question to you, Jason, is when exactly did you sell your soul to the devil? <laughs> the real question is what did I get in exchange? <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, you know, I started, um, I started playing, I begged my parents for a piano when I was seven, I think. And I have no musicians in my family. It's not sort of part of uh, you know, the family tree. We, we have no artists anywhere. Um, or at least no actual professional artists anywhere. And, um, but I said I wanted a piano and my grandfather was sort of a hoarder and he had them in his basement. He had an old upright in his basement which they sort of brushed up a little bit and one day I, I came into my living room and there it was. And so I sat down and started trying to figure out how to play the theme from Star Wars or something and that was kind of, that was that. But uh, you know, what I always say is I was the second child and as anyone who's a second child or especially anyone who's a first child knows, you know, that means all I'm trying to do all the time is get attention and so, uh, you know, <laughs> I was, I was working from a very early age to make sure that people noticed me, so this turned out to be the way to do it. <laughs> did you start piano lessons then, or you? I did, I, but only in the most sort of rudimentary way, because I wouldn't practice, because that wasn't gratifying. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and so I, um, you know, I, I, I took lessons for three or four years, but I never got to any particular level. I was sort of on, you know, the John Brimhall book three, and, you know, it was sort of, everyone rolling their eyes every week. But while I was doing that, I was also writing songs and I would sit and write songs and play in my own sort of crazy idiosyncratic way and, and do that so that I kind of then, my mother was like, well, I'm not gonna keep paying for lessons if you're never gonna practice. So I just kept playing and playing and playing, but I never was doing it according to the books. Uh, and I sort of got uh, self-taught as far as theory and how to read charts and chords and things like that. And then right when I was about to graduate from high school, my mother said, well, what is it you're planning to do? I said, well, I have to go to a music school. Of course, that's what I do. And she said, well, it would help if you could read music, probably. That would, <laughs> that might be valuable. And so we sort of shoved me into piano lessons for the last year of high school. And I sort of crammed how to figure out how to integrate what I knew how to do with what actually was on the page. And I'm, I'm still not sensational with the page, but I'm obviously a lot better than I was. <laughs> I think there are a lot of sort of aspiring musical theater performers and writers here, um, and ones who are beyond aspiring. <laughs> but I, in both senses of that word, in, yeah. in both senses <laughs> of the word. Um, I'm just fascinated about how you guys work together. And I was, was able to watch a little bit of your rehearsal before. How do you evolve this relationship? And is there, it's sort of like there's almost a psychic connection there of how you know reading each other and how you're gonna work together. I mean, on, on my end, <laughs> really my belief is that when you find the people who connect to your material and who you connect to musically, the best thing you can do is let them go do their job. So it's, I don't sort of, I don't think Shoshan and I have ever had a rehearsal where we sit and I sort of like micromanage the phrasing and sort of say, oh, it should be this and that. Often what happens is exactly what you saw today where she's learned the song from a recording that I sent her or something like that. And then we have like 20 minutes before the gig and I'm like, all right, let's try it. And I might say one thing about, oh, no, no, that's E flat, not E natural. She'll be like, oh, ah, and that'll, you know, that'll be the entirety of, of our rehearsal but <laughs> but it's that's as much as that's been the entirety of our rehearsal it's also one of my favorite collaborations in my life and whenever I can sing with Shoshana I do because she just gets the material and so I don't have to sort of say oh no the phrase should go this way or oh what I meant for that what that's supposed to mean acting wise that she gets it she does it she brings herself to it and then I can get out of the way so that's that's my response you well, it took me a number of years to get out of the way um, and just let the let our connection be there and let the music does it for you. Um, but I was so terrified of him and so wanting to please him and so wanting to do his incredible music justice um, that I, I I just think it was kind of um, not stale but just a little stiff and terrifying for me. I don't know how it came across, but it was terrifying. It didn't come and across. Then, um, you were fine. 
Thank you. The gift, oh, thank you. The gift for me is, uh, it's very rare that you come across, thank you, sir. Psychic connection, you there see how that works? There you go, yeah. That you, as a singer, uh, or just an artist in general, with something to say or feelings, uh, that you come across someone who articul articulates them so perfectly, and also, um, write so perfectly for your instrument. And I, I think a lot of women say that about Jason's work, um, but me in particular, I feel like myself uh, in, in particular, um, it's just, a, I, I think it's a powerful connection to his music and, and, and us together, you know? So for me, it was just getting out of the way and just letting the connection be there and not being How do you set keys and things like that if we you know, haven't rehearsed? He does. That's the magic of him. He just knows. I've never gone to him and been like, this is too high or this sits in a weird place. There are very few male composers who know exactly where to put music for women. And um, for me, I mean, the songs aren't even technically challenging. I don't have to go through and maneuver with my voice teacher or anything like I do with a lot of other composers because they just fit in my voice and a lot of women's voices so easily. Every once in a while, there's a murderous vowel or consonant on a, <laughs> on a murderous note, but... Um, My, mine, too. <laughs> and they're not easy. They're challenging. It's, but I love... It's like... It's, it's a... One, if I feel like this is the moment I get to feel like an Olympic athlete as a singer when I'm approaching Jason's material. I mean, part of that really is part of why Shoshana and I can do the work we do together is that that part of her voice happens to be just the part of the voice that I work in the most and that I like the most. So it's not like, oh, maybe I'll take this down a half step because Shoshana's singing it, which I will do with other singers. With Shoshana, it's been pretty much whatever key I throw at her, she's always like, yeah, that's good, that works. Are and you serious? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought you were... Okay. No? <laughs> do you, you do it from a recording, do you provide the recording? That yeah, you... well, it, for the most part, I mean, uh, you know, we've now been doing these shows, this has been like more than 10 years, it's probably been 12 years of, of doing these things together, so I don't even remember how you first, I think, honestly, when we first did the gig, you knew a lot of the songs already, that you just sort of showed up and you were like, oh, well, I know Still Hurting and I know how to do, uh, I'd awesome. give it all for you, oh, well, I don't, okay. <laughs> no, I think you gave me a set list, but now, I don't remember how the original, I mean, some of them I had done in college, um, but uh, now he just sends me, now I know to ask for things. Like, do, you, do you read music? Uh, I do, but I don't need to with Jason. It, with Jason, it's a feeling thing. And if there's a question of a specific note, uh, I mean, I just, I ask him, I don't. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, with, uh, with Cassandra, which tonight she did for the first time, and that's the first time that, uh, that anyone's done that song here. Uh, uh, I sent her a recording of me sort of, she had heard me do it. We did a concert together in London, I guess, two months ago. And I sang Cassandra then, and I said, but when we do the concert in DC, you're singing it. And she was like, okay. Uh, and so she then said, you better send it to me. So I sent her a recording where I was playing the piano part and plunking out the notes at the same time. And then I sent her just an accompaniment that she could sing along to. And so I sent that, and I, again, today was the first time that we worked on it, and you heard, you know, I started playing it, she sang it, at the end of it I said one thing about one phrase, and then she said, okay, let's do it again, we did it again, and that was it. That was one of the most fascinating things when you were doing sort of the run-through, is, as I recall, you sang something, and then after you, you'd gone through the song, you, you said, remember that phrase, she's not angry at him there, she's genuinely wishing him well. Did I do it? Did I do it tonight? I wasn't paying attention. I was playing. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, did I do it? Did I do it? Everything you do is perfect. <laughs> I do it. I'm yeah. never leaving the library of Congress. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fascinating to me the, the idea of what an intention is behind a song and a moment versus what the singers bring to it and I'm not even sure how to articulate this question. Um, no, I, I, I think what you're asking me is, is when you're a storyteller, and I think both of us are storytellers, that's part of what we do, it's much more effective for me to tell you what the story is that I need you to tell than for me to tell you how to tell that story. If, if I had said to her, oh no, do it with, the, you know, go lighter on it and, you know, it should be more piano and then maybe sort of hang this one note over by an extra eighth note, that may be sort of what I'm hoping comes out, 
but it doesn't mean that she'll understand the story that I want to tell. All I have to say to her is, no, that's supposed to be genuine and it's supposed to be sort of kind. And by saying that, I know that she's going to interpret that musically to mean something. I don't, I don't know that with every singer I work with, but I know that with Shoshana. If I say something about what the storytelling is supposed to be, she knows how to tell stories with the music, as well as just sort of say the words, but the music is going to tell a story also. And so I can, you know, I can trust that I, I can say that and it works. I hope. I'm flattered. I nailed it tonight, since you didn't see I nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> it, it. It interests me that most of what you sang tonight are theater songs, and in a couple of cases you sort of explicated the story, especially with the new song, but so often it, it seemed unnecessary, and yet there's a lot of detail that may not be clear to the audiences, but somehow the meaning and the understanding comes through. That's because he's a genius storyteller. <laughs> he's a genius. And uh, this is the other thing I say uh, to, to highlight that fact is uh, as, as singers who learn music, his, as I don't know if you noticed, some of the songs are five minutes long and there's a lot of words. And so whenever, like when I got Cassandra, I was like, Wah. and I <laughs> called Eden because my friend Eden had just done it a couple weeks ago. And I'm like, did you have to learn Cassandra? She was like, girl, I did. And I'm like, <laughs> Okay, it's been a long time since I've had to learn a new song of his, and I, then I checked myself and I was like, the thing with Jason's music is it's very wordy and there are intricate changes each time that make it difficult to learn, but it also tells such a clear story. It's actually not difficult to learn because once you see the arc of the story, it tells itself uh, and your memory just kind of holds onto it. There are not a lot of composers that do that. Sometimes, even pop songs today, I mean, like the dumbest, easiest pop songs, if they don't tell a story, they don't stick in my mind. So that's, I mean, to, and also, he's a great storyteller, which is why you don't need to know the context. You just can infer your own. Like King of the World, I'm always like, what is that about? And he's like, what do you want it to be about? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I used to do a lot more explaining, but I've been doing these concerts for, you know, 25 years or something, and I, at this point, I figure, I, People just go with it, and I, I used to just take decades and decades to explain what every song was about, and I got so tired of the sound of my voice, and I figured nobody's here to hear me talk. So, uh, so I just moved on, and it, it seems to be all right. <laughs> even, also, I suspect that of this audience, you know, 85% of them know everything that I sang. Anyway, they don't need me to tell the whole story of the show. Do you still enjoy singing the songs over again? It do you, do you feel like, okay, I've got to do this one now, or it's... It no, luckily, if, I, if I'm not into it, I don't do it anymore. There's actually one song I don't... I, I, I rarely let anybody do, and I would never do it on my own. I haven't done... I'm not afraid of anything. I think in the last four or five years, I just burned out on it so much, and I, I, it's a perfectly fine song. I just... I, I can't get behind it, and if I can't get behind it, it's hard for me to play. But we did Stars in the Moon at the rehearsal today, and Stars in the Moon, you know, I wrote when I was 21, and... Uh, I, it just it comes out and I play it and it it feels great to play and so I'm sort of like oh okay we can we can do that one I, I, I can always find something in the music to connect me to why I wrote the song and if I know why I wrote it that usually helps me tell the story but I mean I get burned out on things sure um, but none of the stuff we did tonight because if I'm burned out on it I don't have to put it in the program <laughs> why, why didn't you do Stars and Moon we just ran out of time. I mean, oh, okay. <laughs> we didn't do everything. We didn't do anywhere but here. We didn't do stars no, in the moon. But we no, did no pressure. We I'm did sure. good songs. <laughs> Can't it was fun to run it today. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the most recent song you wrote and performed was Hope. Yes. And I, I, I know, at least I understand, it was sort of a burst of inspiration. But do you, do you remember why it, it, Hope instead of fear or prayer or, I mean, just the way you came into that song, it's sort of, there's something unexpected about that word being the direction you went with that feeling. Well, I, it actually, it's the serendipity of what happened. I had been scheduled to perform, Kristen Chenoweth was doing her show on Broadway uh, for about two weeks, and one of the night, every night she would have a special guest come, and she had asked if I would come and be a special guest, because she was doing 50 years long, actually, in her set. And so she said, would you come and be a special guest and maybe sing something new? Because the audience would be, that would be kicky for the audience. And so on election day itself, I was sort of like, gee, I wonder what I'm going to sing for Kristen's show. I have no idea. And then, you know, the end of the world. And then I... Uh, <laughs> if you're not one of us, it's fine. Just know that's how we feel. All right. Um, <laughs> So 
So I got up that morning and I really thought, I'm not gonna go sing with Kristen Chenoweth tonight. That's not how that's gonna go. And I, but I thought, well, I can't leave Kristen in the lurch and just, but I was, I, what am I supposed to sing? And I was like, if I sing, you know, if I sang like the old Red Hills of Home or King of the, it's just, it's deeply hostile. There's just no way to. <laughs> and I didn't want to be hostile. I didn't, and especially with Kristen's show, which is all, you know, sparkly and twirly <laughs> and, you know, all of that stuff. And so I thought, what am I supposed to say? And the first two lines of the song, while I was making breakfast, and in sort of a daze, because I don't think any of us slept, I, 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 I sort of, I said, I come to sing a song about hope, and I, I don't mean it, but that's what I'm here to sing about. And so as I said that, I thought, I guess maybe I'll write a song. Maybe, I, I don't know, what time is it? Can I, because I'm, I'm a very slow writer in general, but I thought, I, I don't know, maybe I can do it. And we had to go, that morning my daughter was interviewing, uh, she's going into seventh grade, and she was interviewing for a, a very schwancy uh, private girl's school on the Upper East Side. And so my wife and daughter went off to go to the interview, and I said, I'll meet you in a minute, I just have to take a shower. And so I went, I took, and while I was in the shower, I was sort of working on the song and sort of coming up with it, which again, this is not my process, but I was just sort of, words were coming, words were coming, words were coming. And I got in the cab uh, to, uh, to go to the school, and I wrote, uh, um, fear never wins, that's what I hope. See, I said hope, the work begins. As I was sitting in the cab, and I was just holding the notepad, open like that, and I walked into a girl's school, which was like, that morning, it was like going to a wake. It was unbearable what it was like in there. It was totally silent, but at the same time, it was this place that was all about, even in light of what had just happened, all about lifting girls up and all about saying to them, you can be what you want to be, that you can be the best things that you have to be. We will support you, we will be behind you, we will understand, and I thought, while I'm sitting there with this notepad in my hand that sings this song, I thought, yes, this is exactly what I want to say. I want to be in this place right now with this, with this sentiment. And uh, our daughter was in doing her interview, and my wife and I were just sitting out there sort of in shock, you know, and, um, and she said to me, what's on the pad? And I said, I, I think it's a song that I'm singing tonight for, uh, <laughs> for Kristen. And she said, well, do you want to show it to me? And I was about to start just in the hallway sort of singing it. And I couldn't actually, I tried to open my mouth and I started crying. I said, I can't yet, I can't do it. I don't know if I'll even be able to do it tonight, but I can't. Um, and so then we uh, got done with the interview, we dropped our daughter off at school and we got back into the house and Hillary was about to give her concession speech. And um, uh, we went into my room with the piano and I said, all right, I'm gonna do this and this is the only time I'm gonna do it before tonight, because I'm gonna have a nervous breakdown if I keep singing this song, so this is it. And I played it, sort of. I mean, you know, I hadn't put my hands on the piano at all while writing it. This is, you had asked me about this this morning. I, I'm not usually a guy who can sort of conceive all of the structure of it without writing anything down or playing it, but I just sort of knew what the chords were. So I played it, we sort of had our moment of semi-catharsis, uh, and then we went down and, and watched the speech, and, I, you know, six hours later, I had to be on Broadway. And at some point during that day, I think I finally did just record it, uh, you know, on my little tape recorder and just put it online, which at least sort of said to me, all right, uh, what I really, I did that honestly so that Kristen and her director could hear it in case they were like, oh God, don't sing that tonight, don't do that. <laughs> um, but fortunately they were both like, oh my God, you have to sing it. So I went and I sang it and, you know, like I said, Kristen's show was all sort of sparkles and, and, uh, and you know, soprano and popular and all of that <laughs> stuff. And. Uh, and then she sang 50 Years Long, which is, you know, a kind of moving moment and a, a nice moment. To, and then she introduced me and asked me to come out on stage. And I did. Uh, and I said, I, um, I wrote this this morning. I, I don't know what to tell you. This is the best I could do. And, um, and so I sang the song. And I couldn't tell, you know, there's a couple of laugh lines early on in the song, as you guys saw. And so the audience laughed, which, thank God. And, you know, they, they were sort of relaxing with me. And I got to the end, and I couldn't actually finish the song. I sort of got the words out somehow, but it was just too much. But we got to the end of the song, and the whole audience just stood up in the middle of the show. And it was, it meant so much to me, not like, oh, yay, Jason, but it was like there was just a moment where I was connecting and saying something for all of those people that they needed to hear. And I felt very grateful for that. And then there were the two guys, probably from you know West Virginia, sitting over here, were like this the whole time. But, you know.
So that was, uh, <laughs> that was how that went. I got through two hours without the F-bomb. You gotta give me a break. <laughs> This is the Library of Congress. No, there's no cursing here. No cursing. No cursing at all. Yeah. I, what is your relation, both of you, your relationship with an audience? How does that affect you, influence you, change your performance? <laughs> I think for me, um, uh, I think my real, uh, my strongest relationship with audience has just really begun as of, as of late, only because I stopped uh, trying to convince them or win them over or impress them or get a certain type of reaction. Now when I come out, my only intention is to connect. So um, regardless of the material, if it's mine, if it's not, um, my intention is just to connect heart to heart um, and get out of my head, basically. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's as articulate as I can be. does what they give you back affect what you do? Do, do you? Uh, I, 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 it, it, it has the potential to, yes. Um, and when they uh, are excited and, and, and enthusiastic and uh, enjoying themselves and making that plane, um, it certainly fuels the fire. Um, and when they are not, uh, it's a challenge to um, keep grounded and keep doing, you know, keep giving your blood and your heart the way that you would if they were enthusiastic about it. But. Um, I think my job is the same regardless, and that's kind of, I don't, I don't know that you fall into that trap like I do, but I used to, I don't no. anymore. I mean, for me, I, I've always worked uh, blessedly under the assumption, since I started doing concerts like this, I work under the assumption that no one's here to sort of hear me sing, and no one's really here to hear me play the piano, they're here for the songs, and so I'm here to serve the songs. And that's, I mean, that, that's a little bit coy, because obviously I know what I can do and that I can sing in a certain way and that I can play the piano in a certain way. And I'll certainly throw that out there, you know. But um, I like to think that the songs are, are doing the work for me and I'm really here to, to channel them. That said, I've had audiences that are not prepared to receive the songs. It doesn't happen very often, obviously. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't play to very large rooms, and honestly, I don't do that many concerts. But I have had a couple of shows in the 20 years where I could just feel like the audience was not really buying what I was selling. Um, and honestly, I, you can get crazy about that, but I, I, maybe I just, I, you know, all those years of having no one like me in high school trained me to just, <laughs> you know, I, it, you know, it's it's okay. I, you can you can have your experience, and if, if it's not the same one I wanted you to have, that's all right. You're, you you know, you paid your money, you get what you want. I'm sorry, you're having a miserable time. It's going to be a long night, but uh, you know, um, you know, I I love to. Uh, there there's something about this kind of mix that we have tonight where I can tell there's easily half the crowd that kind of can sing along with all of it and knows all, and then another half of the crowd that really doesn't entirely know what they're in for. And when there's that balance, it's a great thing, because you can feel the audience sort of talk to each other, you know, that they just, they share this thing that it's all right to like it, and it's all right to be challenged by it, and it's all right to respond to it, we're all gonna be fine. Um, whenever I have to play for an audience that really doesn't know anything about my work, that's a, a big uphill climb, because the material is so dense, uh, and a lot of it's so, it's so hard on, you know, on your first hearing, that I have to be very careful about how I program that set, and I tend to do a lot of jiggering around while I'm in the middle of playing, that I'll be like, oh, I was gonna do this song, but I'm not gonna do that now, let me just play. So I can respond to the energy that way and feel that way, but so much of what I do with the audience doesn't have to do with me as a performer, because I really, most of my time, I don't spend thinking about when I sing it, I spend most of my time thinking about when the actor sings it and when the character sings it. So nights like this are sort of a, a fun, kicky little break, but most of the work is about eliciting an audience response in a very specific way that's built into the writing. So if I've done that right, hopefully when I perform it, it's just sort of there. What does it feel like having Sondheim say, I love Betsy is the best opening number since The Music Man? What? He did. It's true. <laughs> that was, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was awesome. Uh, <laughs> The funny thing is that Honeymoon in Vegas was never the show I thought was gonna be Steve's cup of tea. You know, I, I, I've known Steve for a while, and like any young Steve. writer, Steve, he's Steve. I can call him Steve. Um, 
But you know, like any young writer of musical theater, all I ever wanted to do was to get Steve to like me. I was like, please, Steve, like my work. And so I, I think Parade in the last five years, those were the kind of shows I thought, oh, he's really going to get behind those. He's going to be into those. And he was kind of like, you know, those are nice. And then, you know, <laughs> Honeymoon in Vegas, which is so like down the middle 1961 musical comedy, that's the one he's like, I love that show and that opening number is the greatest thing I ever heard. And he says, he told me that he, he puts on the CD, he drives out to Connecticut to his country house every weekend, and he puts on I Love Betsy is the first thing that he wants to listen to in the car, and then he just puts it on repeat and he listens to it over and over again, and he cries. And anyone who knows Steve knows he cries all the time. And, and I was like, I Love Betsy? Really? That's the one? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm grateful, but I, that was, it, was, it was a surprise that that was the one, that, I, you know, I guess he could have said freaky freaky, that would have been even weirder, but you know, still, I Love Betsy, okay, great. I mean, I worked really hard on it, I'm glad it works. <laughs> well, I'm curious, what do you guys like other than each other? Are there... Nothing. <laughs> Are, are there other songwriters we should be looking for and other performers we should, who are up and coming that we wouldn't know yet but that you guys see the spark in? You're, if you don't already know Pasek and Paul, you're about to. That, th that, those are the only other composers that I get excited about working with um, besides him. Like, uh, and I, I, I hope to God before... I, one of us goes that I get to, to work with Steve, Steve, but, um, but n as far as up and coming, I'm not, I'm not interested in anybody else really besides Pasek and Paul. Um, yeah, I like Benjamin Justin. Um, I think Joe Iconis is really talented, a very talented guy. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm married to a really exceptional songwriter, uh, so that helps. Um, uh, that's Georgia Stitt, S-T-I-T-T. -T. Um, <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of sensational performers. I think in a lot of ways we've reached a, a real golden age in terms of the performers because there, there's so much fluidity. When I started, when we did Songs for a New World, it was really hard to find that cast, especially for the $20 we were paying them. Uh, at the, the, <laughs> but it was really hard, you know, and Billy Porter and Andrea were both people I knew, you know, for many, many years beforehand, so they did it as sort of a favor to me and I built the show on them. But it was a really hard show to cast, and I think it would not be as hard to cast it now because the vernacular has kind of grown into what people are more used to singing. And uh, I think that's true of the musicians also. I think with the, the stuff that I used to write, nobody could play it. You know, it was always like, oh, who can do this? And now there's a lot of guys who, uh, and girls who, who, uh, who, who can get their fingers around my, my stuff, and that's very gratifying. I don't... I don't think it's because I was necessarily, you know, so much ahead of my time, but I just think that the work has kind of filtered in uh, in its way. Well, you changed the game for those of us coming up. Like before you, there weren't songs like that to be working on in college. There weren't challenges like that to be had. We had, you know, this musical theater singers anthology <laughs> with like the basic soprano stuff. The I mean, the usual stuff. Um, so you've changed that. And then as 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 time has gone on, the, the social media has made that more like accessible in a way that it wasn't necessarily for us. We had to go to the library and check out CDs. We didn't even have CDs when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, well. <laughs> Did your daughter get in the school? Did I, oh, we don't know yet, okay. though to be honest, I, I, I sort of, I got over the whole, oh, she has to go to a girl's school. It was that morning, it was really, really seductive. And then after that, I was like, just because I want that doesn't mean that's right for her. And I, it, we went to a couple of other non girls schools, and I was like, no, actually, she sort of belongs here more. I'm, not, I'm sure you're all deeply, deeply yeah. interested in that. <laughs> well, it, it, the, they say leave them wanting more, and I want to save your voice for Sunday after <laughs> all you, you've given us. So thank you both for being here. Thank you all very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.